Um, so I'm going to talk today about how to make workflows work for you, which is um, more or less an introduction to the Zope and Plone workflow story, uh, and actually the workflow stories. Uh, it's intended for a pretty general audience, even so the talk says it's intermediate, but uh, developers will definitely also get something out of it, uh, of what we have been up to, uh, some really interesting technical pieces. Um, so my name is uh, Stefan Richter, and I have been involved in the Zoop community since 1999. Um, I was there at the first sprints. I, I developed large parts of Zoop 3, and I also have to admit I am the creator of Z3C4, which you all love to hate, uh, I've heard this conference. So um, today I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about workflows and, and hopefully give you some historical context. The last time, uh, I thought I talked at, uh, at PlonConf in Seattle, till several people here told me that I actually was at 2008 in Washington DC as well, which had been completely erased out of my mind. And uh, somebody even told me that I gave a talk that year. Unfortunately, that was the first talk after the party, and I have zero recollection of this talk, and I have been told the talk was pretty awful. So <laughs> apologies to that. I really thought it was 2006 that, that I gave last the talk. What happened uh, since 2006, um, I had two kids, uh, two sons, Anton is now nine and Conrad is already six, uh, which is great, but it also means uh, I have less time to, to play around with the technical stuff. Um, a couple of years back, about seven years back, I had some cardio problems and I decided I need to work out a little bit more and of course, because I do everything in the extreme for the people who know me, uh, I decided to do a couple of Ironmans and trained up for that uh, and completed that. Um, in 2007, I also decided uh, to leave the consulting business and, and try startup life. And so I've been involved in four uh, startups. Kias uh, did, was in the healthcare industry. They try to improve uh, people's lives. Um, at Active Broadband, uh, they, were, they had Comcast as a large customer. I developed a multicast uh, IPTV system. Uh, at Cypher Health, we, we, did, we did some Obamacare related stuff. And now I'm since three years at Shoebox where we create, uh, where we handle all of the governance of early stage companies from incorporation to equity management, board management. Uh, if you have a small uh, a corporation or in Germany an AG, right, you know that there's just a lots of overhead uh, with maintaining that. Um, and, and, and so Shoebox does a lot of this for you. All right, now enough about me. Um, so here's a, sort of the history of uh, Zoop and in that sense also Plone's workflow story. Uh, it all started in February 2001, uh, really with the first commit to the CMF, and I dig this up, the Tresivas did that uh, commit, was already a reference to CMF core workflow core. And I remember the story actually quite nicely. Everybody in the community was excited about CMF coming out because Zoop Corp had for a long time, or Digital Creations had for a long time announced that it would be coming. And everybody said like, but there's no workflow. You have all this workflow core definition and there is none. And, and Zoop Corp said like, well, you should community, you should develop your own workflow. And everybody's like, no, but we don't want to. And uh, eventually uh, Digital Creations got uh, pressured into releasing their internal workflow tool based on C uh, CMF core uh, called D, uh, DC Workflow that uh, Shane first publicly committed in, in June 2001. So it didn't take too long uh, for the community to pressure digital creations into that. And it filled out all the functionality and as I have learned this week, uh, DC flow Workflow is still in production and, and running, which is quite interesting if you think how old it is. Um, eventually, now I think by that time it was called Zopcorp, uh, paid uh, Zopcorp in, in a con uh, was paid to develop another workflow product, and basically uh, it was for for the Navy, and they required all these very stringent government processes, and that didn't really fit well in the DC workflow story. So Jim looked around and and found um, the WFMC standard for which editors existed and developed a workflow engine on top of this, which is known as zope.wfmc. And he tried to attempt to standardize this so multiple communities could share sort of this sort of workflow approach. Um, clearly with, with the departure of, of Zope Corp doing this type of work, uh, 
it died in 2011. And actually, the story around this is uh, that Jim likes to tell, Paul, well, or Paul likes to tell, Paul Everett, is the Navy paid Zoop Corp a lot of money to put workflows into the system, but then they didn't like and didn't want to actually follow the process, and they paid them a lot of money to rip it all back out. So <laughs> Zoop WFMC never really saw, it in, uh, saw production life for a long time uh, uh, in, in, in Zoop Corp's world. So the last sensible commit was in 2011. Uh, as a reaction to Zoop WFMC, because it was the only Zoop 3 story, uh, oh wait, I didn't turn this on. It was the only uh, Zoop 3 story, is that? Uh, I get an echo here. Can you guys hear me back there? Okay, so I'll leave the mic off, that's better. Um, <coughs> he, he I don't know whether you guys remember, I remember this vividly. Martin Fasen ran around the community and said like, Everything is too complicated in Zoop 3. All these adapters, these utilities, that's crazy. And he had this tick for a couple of months to develop the hurry namespace, where everything is done in a hurry and very simple. And one of the outcomes was that he wanted to reproduce what DC workflow does for Zoop 2. He created hurry.workflow uh, for Zoop 3. Um, I checked, he didn't seem to use it anymore, doesn't seem to use it anymore. And it ended up dying uh, in 2013, was at least the f last real bug fix that I commit. Well, along came my new startup, Shoebox, and it was a perfect match for Workflow Engine. So we decided to resurrect Zoop.wfmc and see what we could do with it. And this talk is mostly about what we were able to do with the base and where we went and, and the problems we solved. But let's go back. So what is DC workflow and hurry workflow? It is known as a state-based workflow, right? That's what the community uh, usually calls this. Uh, and the way it works is you have a target, in your case usually a content object in Plon uh, or document, and you store, you have a single attribute uh, where you store the state of that object, and then really the workflow engine consists out of defining transitions between these states and including permissions and all this kind of good stuff that belongs to it. Uh, so the, the state machine, I want to really call it is, is a state machine, manages the state and the transitions and then the progression of the states and in, enforces the rules of the transitions. Right? And it's, it's very simple. It's very like, I think hurry.workflow is only 150 lines of code, which really represents the core of such an, uh, a state machine. So, I, I went uh, to the Plone documentation and I found this example that I had seen already 15 plus years ago as the example for how to publish things on Plone and it's still in the documentation so I just redrew it and put it up here. So here's how it works, right? A state-based workflow. You have three states, draft, pending and published and you define the transitions which are represented by the errors and I put uh, the actors that can, or, uh, or participants the role or the roles that, that can execute that action here as well to, to simulate uh, the, the, uh, the security. Now, really the start and finish here makes no sense. Uh, I just did it so you know how, how to read it and that it goes from left to right uh, because you're really maneuvering states, right? You, do, you don't think really about activities. Uh, also very interesting, uh, you can then take a published object and put it, retract it back to the draft. So, so this is right, what, what you guys, if you use Plone, do all day long. You might uh, adjust this, add more steps or more states, uh, more transitions, less transitions, but that's basically how it works. Now, the reality is state-based workflows are not really workflows. And uh, there are two big problems with this. First of all, you can only manage a single target, like a single content object. And you can really only maintain one state at a time unless you define a second attribute and play this entire game again. And I was asking actually all week uh, around here, so how is it done, especially the single target. That, that really bothers me as a limitation. And, and I was really hoping for the answer that somebody tells me, well, really we create like a folderish object and dump all our resources like images and so on that belong to an article or blog post and publish that but nobody gave me this answer. So it was all about like, ah, we open a transaction and we push both all the artifacts through and then we commit the transaction and it all works out. So sort of that was my, 
the answer. Uh, and I, I was like sort of disappointed. I thought it had gotten, gone a little bit further than that in the last uh, 10 years since I have been paying attention. Now, then I thought like, you know what? I really think we invented state-based workflows. So I went out there and looked for state-based workflows. And I do, ironically, the .NET world, especially Microsoft SharePoint and even the Java world, have picked up this term, but I have not found a reference prior to 2001. So, are we to blame? <laughs> of having invented state-based workflows? Probably so. <laughs> there, uh, it's, it's quite ironic. There, there are lots of things in the Python and larger tech community that were actually uh, invented by the Zoop uh, and Plone community that people now just accept as a fact of life. Uh, we start with the term sprint that was taken by Trasivas, um, and it ends with relative and absolute imports in Python, which were definitely a ZC man invention, even so Guido will never admit it. I was in the room when he picked this up. So, cool. so let's talk about <coughs> activity-based workflows. Clearly, at ZOPWMC is an example, and it is really based on BPMN. And BPMN is a graphical representation of, of processes, and it is widely used in many, many different industries. Um, so, for example, I, I was in China uh, a few years back and, and of course, all, uh, at a manufacturing company for electronics and they are, of course, all ISO 9001 certified, which is a quality assurance standard. And what do I see? A gigantic wall with a gigantic process looking exactly like this. Oops. Um, let me see that I can turn this off. Hmm? Um, with a gigantic list of like these boxes they are describing how the quality assurance process works and, and non-surprising if you talk to companies like IBM, Siemens, uh, you know, Deloitte, any of those big IT companies when they talk about workflow they mean that and they all have super sophisticated tools to run these type of processes in any sort of industry whether it's uh, manufacturing, data warehousing, whatnot, and, and execute these workflows. So uh, let's get back a little bit to the history. So BPMN exists for a long time, and it was mostly meant so that everybody speaks a common language, like everybody knows how to read a construction plan, you want to read a workflow. That's what BPMN was meant. The problem was people wanted to automate these processes, but BPMN 1.0 did not define a serialization format. So a, a bunch of the big players got uh, together and uh, created the WFMC, the Workflow Management Coalition, and defined an XML-based serialization format called XPDL. And so XPDL was then used by, by all the early workflow engines as, as the uh, input format. Now, in the last few years, uh, BPMN 2.0 was released, and it finally specified an XML serialization format of its own. It's part of the BPMN 2.0 standard. So if in some sense, uh, XPDL is now obsolete. But there are so many processes out there still using it that uh, it will be around for a very long time. Now, the reason Jim also chose XPDL is because there was a, back then even in 2004, there was already an editor around called the Java Workflow Editor was known as Java, uh, sometimes also we find references together for a together workflow that can uh, edit these XPDL files, including the ones that Zoop WFMC uh, could digest. And here you see a screenshot of such an editor with one of our more complicated or, or re usual workflows um, loaded up. And the nice thing about a Java workflow editor is, is it's highly customizable because it, it's intended to be white labeled in four large corporations. So the guys have a lot of bank customers and other highly structured organizations. I'll get to this in a bit. So I convert, let's convert our state-based workflow into an activity-based workflow. You will see a few differences. So these are our actors here and, and these lanes are known as swim lanes. And, and you basically, and you always, almost always have a system swim lane. Where, this, where, where the backend executes something. And basically, instead of describing states and transitions, 
you only describe activity things that you do, like more like the transition. Uh, but it's, it's very different, right? So you create a draft of your article. Then you ask the reviewer or the manager or the editor to review the article and then publish it. And you can see publish is already uh, a system step that is not even a human interaction, right? That happens once the, uh, once the article has been reviewed. This little uh, diamond with the X is called an OR gate uh, in BPMN. And it's basically just a simple if statement. You can have multiple, more than two coming out of this. Uh, at Shoebox, we always make it a Boolean decision because it makes it much, much easier to read and follow the workflows over time. And uh, you can say no, then we go back into uh, draft stage and we do yes, uh, then we publish it. Uh, I also added here, if the creator wants to retract his article, uh, he can use an, this is an exception flow, that's why it's red. They can retract it. So, so you can have multiple endpoints. I just wanted to demonstrate that as well. Okay, are there questions about this? Because we're building up on this example for a little bit. Yeah. How is this different? In other words, so you, you, your rectangular box, that's a state, which is a nine, and your arrows are what we call verbs, the action. No, exactly, it's not. You see that, look how I did not use nouns. I we, we, in Shoebox, it's part of our quality insurance that these boxes are never nouns, they're always verbs. It's create, draft, review, publish. So these are actions. Also, I have not make, made a single statement about what artifacts this uh, workflow creates. Does it create one document? Does it create a document with lots of images? Mm -hmm. um, does it create emails? You know, all sorts of artifacts. I've made no statements about that yet. Right? So there's actually no state from a content point of view involved here. And Trust me, I have, when I started this uh, in 2013 again, I had to retrain myself too. It is very, very hard to, to make the transition initially, but once you get it, then it's easy. But it's, yeah. So instead of just saying create draft, you could just say create, yes. review, publish. And you could, if you wanted to throw a noun in there, you could just say create thingy, right. whatever it is. Right, exactly. But we specifically want to stay with our publication workflow and publishing an article, yeah. so let's, Keep that in mind. Yeah. So, so let's because well, let's let's look at the issues of this high-level workflow. This workflow, as I wrote it, is too high-level to be useful. It is very, very hard to write machine-executable code based on that workflow that actually will execute anything sensible because it leaves too much open. And that's and that means the engine provides really trivial value. Right? So there was almost no point in writing a workflow engine just for, for doing that. And, and that's, I think, the reason why Zop WFMC didn't survive initially is because it was way too high level for people to do anything useful with it. Uh, and really the only benefit now we get, right, that we didn't have with the Plone workflows or with the DC workflow, is a graphical representation. But the graphical representation at that high level is so trivial that uh, how much does it explain to you what you wouldn't have understood before? So now, I actually took that very trivial translation of the state-based workflow and actually implemented it as it, it would be runnable in Shoebox. So I created that workflow and stuck it into our system and, and this is what I had to come up with. First of all, we never talked about who the creator and the reviewer are. So the first thing is you need to assign them. Several workflow systems hook uh, their workflow engines up to LDAP and they auto-detect these things. We have found that doing that implicitly was not a good idea, so we have switched completely off assigning these swim lanes manually. And assigning a creator basically says, hey, assign this lane to the person who initiated the process. Uh, and the reviewer, because we are a you know, legal processes thing, is I assign to the president of the company. Only the president of the company can approve these articles just simply so it fits in the system nicely. We don't have a good concept of managers yet, so it wasn't that easy to do. So I changed the, the language a little bit to say author article, uh, which basically means enter the title, the lead-in, and the description. And I will go, I'll show you this in the system in a second. Well, just because I provided the data, this is just simply a, a simple form input, similar to what you would auto-generate with all the nice plone tools, 
you then have to generate the article. And in our case, these are mostly PDF documents. So in my case, I, cr I create a simple PDF document for review. And then let's, let's skip that incoming OR gate. And then, right, because, I just, because the creator never saw the generated article, I need a review step. So I need to give the, um, do I have actually, oh, I have even laser points so I can throw it further away. So uh, you, can, you want to give the user the ability to review the article and potentially go back. And we do have capabilities to step back. Um, so we skip this for now. And then this is an end gate, which means execute things in parallel because we send things off to approval to the reviewer to, rev to approve the article. But you know what? We don't want the creator to just sit there and not know what's going on, right? Because this approval in, our, in shoe boxes and in, the real, in our real cases is many, many steps long because mm -hmm. first the lawyers have to review it, then the board might have to review a document, then you know, who knows who else has to give a sign off. That's the, all depending on policy. Uh, so you want to give the creator some feedback. And, 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 and this work item waits until this, or this activity waits until that activity completes. And then this gate waits until both arrows, both transitions, arrive. Um, OK, then it goes on. And depending on what the approval was like, if it was not approved, we go back to review. That's why we have to reset the rejection reason, right? So we have to clear it out so it doesn't go to no all the time. And then you go to yes. And, and you see yes is orange, which means it is the default flow. So if nothing, if it doesn't find anything, or this, if any of the conditions are false, then it always, it's like the else statement. That's basically the else. And then it's a system step to publish the article. In our case, this means uh, setting a finalized tag to it, assign certain tags to put it in the right folder, et cetera, et cetera. And then you really don't want to let the creator go from wait to approval to nothingness. You want to tell him, hey, your article is now published. You can now do X, Y, Z. So it is a, it's a convention at Chewbox to always have a next steps where we explain to you what happened afterwards. The other thing that we are doing is we we are defining wizards, as you will see in a moment, and I want to point this out here so you can pay, uh, so, so we see this and then working in the system. So we, we say this, 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 and this work item are in one wizard. You just say you will have a wizard, and so you will see that for those four steps, we have a nicely created uh, wizard on top. And it auto generates that all just by us putting a little marker on there. You have a wizard, you have a wizard, you have a wizard, you have a wizard. It, scans the process definition and figures all this out. Uh, this also has a, a wizard. So I ran off, oh, so I ran through this and I thought like I created a great shoebox process. Well, our QA failed because there's even one more step missing here. How does a reviewer even know that he has to review or she has to review an article? Well, there's, there should be probably an email step somewhere here that is only sent the first time that says, hey, an article is ready for your re review. So I hope you get a sense to what level of granularity you have to get to to make these workflows really useful. Oops, I want to turn on my screen so off. Oh, dang it. So, all right. So I need to be behind the port now anyways because I want to show you a demo. And so, all our shoebox examples are modeled after Silicon Valley with Pied Piper and all its characters. So if you watch the show, you will get the references. If not, it will just be normal. So Erlek is uh, he's a wannabe president of the company, but he's not, as you know if you saw the show. But he is allowed to publish an article. So this is our interface. Uh, I, I can explain more of this later, come to me after the talk if you're interested in some of the other things we did. But we want to publish the article and from now on, everything is defined by the workflow definition we saw. You can see the wizard here. You see all the same uh, titles show up and I can just now type in um, Bronkampf article in, it's 2016 so I won't forget. All right, and some text. And, and this is super trivial, right? Um, you will also notice I can discard a process 
uh, at any time. So we, we made that possible as well. So we continue. I can now review my article. Uh, I can download the PDF. Uh, I'm not going to open this right now. Because, but we can also view the article in HTML because we can generate out of our XML document templates. And we can, for example, change the title. We can move to the next section, et cetera, et cetera. So I save this. And now I said, like, OK, my article is perfect. I send it off. And I didn't put a nice message here. Usually, we would put a really nice message here. But you get a rate step. You're notified that you're waiting for somebody to approve this. Usually, we, we even put the person here who is the approver and whatnot. But on the other side of things, oops, uh, there is Richard Hendricks, who is actually the president of Pied Piper. And he already, and we are using, yes, we are using WebSockets to push things through. Um, he now sees he has an article to approve. He can get a little quick overview. He sees, oh, it comes from Ehrlich, et cetera, et cetera. The document, unfortunately, is not showing up here because I didn't assign a certain tag, I have been told. But we can go in here, and he can now approve the article. Uh, a couple of cool things. Our document templates can be rendered into a visual format. So any condition, any loops can have a visual representation. So our lawyers can review even just the template. Uh, if we would have multiple versions, we can even visualize version differences. And we ended up developing our own XML diffing library based on the famous white paper for this. Okay, so we continue. And Richard is done. Unfortunately, he doesn't get a next step. So that would be probably another QA thing that would pot, pop up. But if we see due to the push, thanks to the push, uh, the next steps show up. Every time we press continue, we send actually a task to Celery. And if the tasks take a long time, we actually, there's a spinner that will sh push back and tell you where, what it is currently working on. So there's a lot of uh, cool uh, WebSocket-based technology and, and, and async technology in all of this. So we can do the next. Unfortunately, uh, Ehrlich is not privileged enough to see these documents. So we go back to Richard. And we can see if we go to his documents, so we can go to articles, Plone, the PlonConf article showed now up. And it didn't show, I should have shown that, it didn't show up before it wasn't published because certain tags get set. So we have actually this concept of states as well, but we just call them tags that are namespaced. And, and we just have multiple tags on one attribute and we manage them through our workflows. OK, are there questions about that example? Cool. So, you yeah. mentioned uh, the um, OR gate, the X. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there's, you didn't elaborate on it. You said, we'll move on from that. Yeah, OK, sure. So, the uh, one on the left. yeah, we have learned over time that OR gates always come in pairs. Because, or, or most often come in pairs. Because you say X OR, but then you usually with one, you go back. Right? And you have to join together. While the XPDL standard allows for many transitions to come into a main activity, because this is also just an activity, several other not so sophisticated editors do not allow it. So, and it is much easier to reason about your workflows and, and read them if you make another OR gate there. And OR gate only means it only waits for one incoming transition and not for both. Uh, the end gate is exactly the opposite. It always does send off both, not just one, and it waits for both. Or, or for n. It, it can be any amount. And we have some where we do five or six things uh, at the same time. All right. Any other questions? Cool. So just a little summary of what did we, what are the big things that we had to build in order to make all this work? Um, security, but Plone has that too. Check, right? That's we are using the ZOP libraries after all. We use ZOP security, of course, and ZOP security policy. Uh, so we, we have exactly the same type of capabilities as they are on Plone today. Machine executable. DC workflow does that too, right? It's machine executable. Check. Full user interface generation and any other I.O. generation. That only works for DC workflow because it's super, super trivial. And you can do one size fits all, basically, approach, right? Because you only have to show states the current state and what other state you can get to. 
there's very little metadata even around any of this. So, and for the publication workflow, you know, that's not, not that matter. But all of these screens that you saw, they're all standard activity types, applications they are called. So that's that. So you need to implement back and forth. I didn't demonstrate this, but you can go back and forth. You saw the back and forth arrow, right? Uh, because people expect if they see a visit, I want to jump to this point. You can also click on the visit itself and jump to a particular point. Uh, and then you want to go forward again. And then the problem that arises out of this is, well, you should really remember the data that I typed in in the past and in the future, which is also not necessarily trivial, especially if you now make changes in the past that affect the future. Right? So you have to be very careful of what data you retain. Uh, discarding, and of course discarding with cleanup. So you say, I don't want this workflow. It was a crapshoot. Uh, ignore it. And so you want to make sure all the articles and everything gets deleted. Exception handling, that was what broke SOAP WFMC's neck originally. And then migrations. Migrations are super, super important. As we upgrade our applications and our processes, you know, you, well, you, if you update your process, you cannot just run on the new version suddenly because where are you? Do you have all the data? So we do a lot of version management and then migrate data very carefully. And that's a, it's a big problem. We haven't really fully solved it yet. Okay, so we did a bunch of SOAP WFMC enhancements and all of these enhancements are, we put back into the SOAP WFMC core. Unfortunately, not yet in the SOAP Foundation uh, repository. Uh, it's on our shoebox. Uh, we have a clone on shoebox, but you know, if there's interest from the clone community to use SOAP WFMC, we would have certainly good motivation uh, to, to clean things up, write the necessary tests and documentation and, uh, and, and publish it further. But Till now, nobody came along, so we hadn't had much uh, um, you know, willpower to do it. So we, XPDL 2.1, uh, the original one only supported XPDL 1.0. Uh, we added extended attributes. So to any activity, to any process, to any participant, you can put any amount of metadata. And in fact, entire XML substructures called extended attributes. And that wasn't implemented. We used that heavily to, do, to hint the UI, to hint as you will see, the simulations and the testing uh, and many other things. So this is basically our crutch to do a lot, a lot of the automation. Candidate support. So let's say you have two presidents of the company and you might think that's not possible, but yes, it is. You can have co-presidents uh, that can approve. So you have multiple people. We have the capability of saying, yes, multiple people can do this and somebody takes the ball and says, I'm going to do it. So candidate support, which is a very core feature of workflows. And we implemented subflows, think about it as, as macros, right, like metal macros. Task scripts, which are basically arbitrary Python scripts. Um, you, you did see one with the, with the reset. Uh, data field support, which gives you uh, data typing. Uh, parameters didn't support initial values. Otherwise conditions, the else case that I showed you. Uh, script tag support, because you can specify on a process what scripting language you're using. And arguments to the activities, right, because uh oh, we lost it. Do you guys yeah, have no, it over there? No. Oh, okay. I hope the clicker works far enough so I, I come over here. I have been warned that that would happen. Oops. Uh, so uh, arguments to activities, because you pass in variables, you get variables out, used to be lists. And we converted them to dictionaries, which was a big pain for our migration because it's much easier if you have key value pairs to do migrations if you get new arguments. Unfortunately, this was thanks to Jim. I didn't tell him about this little thing uh, when, when we met earlier this week. And then deadline support. You can say, if an activity hasn't been touched for a day, what do you want to do about it? So you can raise an exception and, and for, take an alternate path uh, through the system. All right. We also enhanced the workflow editor a little bit. We worked with the Together Workflow guys. Uh, they do a lot of uh, stuff in the, in the Java community for banks. Uh, especially in Switzerland and, and Austria. Uh, the, guy, the, the owner is Austri originally from Austria, but they are, they're all in Thailand. Uh, so so we, we, we paid them to, to do a couple of things like uh, small bug fixes or, and larger bug fixes that made it possible to use, uh, how do labels can be positioned, script support, uh, and external editor support. So you can click on a thing 
and if you specify Python as a script, it uh, opens it up in a temporary file that has a right file extension, so you get the syntax highlighting and all that kind of good stuff in your external editor. Uh, that we could do a lot more, but we have simply haven't gotten around to it yet. Okay, so let me talk about a couple of really hard problems that we had to solve. Uh, discarding a workflow. Well, originally, uh, Zoop WFMC didn't keep track of any of the activities it had already finished. So we had to start keeping track of all the finished activities. So when you discard it, we could, do, uh, we could undo them. It requires for all of your activities or these applications that drive these activities to be reversible, right? You have to be able to say, this generated a document. Now we need to remove the document. There are some cases where you have irreversible actions. For example, you created a user. The user has received an email to log in. Well, just because you want to undo your workflow, you don't want to create suddenly a broken link for the user because you deleted the user. So it's better to just leave the user existence. They don't have any access anyway, so it doesn't matter. Or you make the workflow simply non-discardable. And, th and the prime example of this is once all parties signed a document, it is legally binding. The document cannot suddenly go away because you discarded your workflow. So in those cases, we make the, the uh, workflows at that point non-discardable, which sometimes really makes our users mad but, uh, because we make it so easy to execute legally documents that they don't even think about it that way. Uh, back and forth, I mentioned that already before. You have to be able to revert the activities. Uh, you have to restore the workflow state properly uh, and remember the inputs, as I mentioned. And that's a very, very hard problem. We spent alone just to solve this. There are six men months worth of effort in that. Uh, the wizard, I mentioned that before, you, you saw it nicely going up on top. Uh, the hard part about it is it needs to be generated before any workflow state exists. And as more workflow state comes into play, the wizard actually adjusts and finds the path that you're actually going to take. So once you reject, it will readjust, for example, the wizard. Um, this is also a very hard problem to get right. Uh, especially because of all the splitting and joining that you can do. And we spent roughly th at least three, if not four to five men months just solving the visa problem. Uh, what happened? Next. Whoa. Okay, there it is. Now, if you have a lot of processes, and I don't know how the clone world does that, I, I would love to, to talk to some people how this is done, and I'm running this video, which is a simulation of our workflow, run in Firefox, fully automated, uh, is testing, right? And so you want to automatically test your workflows, you want to have coverage. Uh, so the big part is you have to provide a strategy for uh, completing your applications. And that took us also two to three attempts to do. Uh, we ended up writing extended attributes on each activity, on each interactive activity that the user has input to, define how the user would input stuff, and then co complete the activity, and then it would keep going. Uh, you want to have save points. We have processes that take 10 minutes to run, our large ones, like this. If the developer works on the last two work items, they don't, you don't want to have them wait nine minutes before they get any feedback. So we create save points that you can create and you can start the workflow anytime from that spot. Debugging, you can stop at any activity. We can take screenshots uh, at, an, at, at any interactive activity. Uh, and we can parameterize our simulations so that uh, we can create very rich setup environments. For example, the Pied Piper example that I showed you, we just completely simulate that. It's never typed in from hand. So. Let's see what's next. Okay, so <clears throat> I don't know how, how we're doing in time. Oh, almost good. So quality assurance. So I'm going to just show you the quality assurance instead of going all the steps. So we created a very rich dashboard because we deal with lawyers and they have zero tolerance for problems. Uh, not, not just functionally, but also from a, from a language point of view. So we have 98 processes that can be started from the UI. There are about two or 300 of them with all the sub-processes. Uh, for those 98 processes, we wrote 300 sims, 
And then we have all sorts of document templates and we test all the permutations of these documents. And in those 98 processes, we have 3,500 activities. So that's a lot of stuff um, to run. And yesterday, our QA dashboard was all green and it was quite boring. Uh, but today, um, we, I have some interesting stuff to show. So we test all our processes on, on the four major browsers. Uh, and then we run also a bunch of QA checks. So I can show you uh, a little bit of output. So let's not take the stock transfer. So for example, we, it ran an Internet Explorer, the simple workflow. So we get all the Internet Explorer output, including a screenshot for each step of the workflow. In this case, it was just one. So maybe I should choose a really a little bit more interesting example, like the stock transfer. So here you can see Internet Explorer. It tells you it was Internet Explorer 11. And when it ran, and here are all the screenshots of Internet Explorer. And so our UX department can go through these PDFs and check that all the browsers render the stuff correctly. Uh, if, if the uh, simulation was successful, you can also see all the documents that get generated here for your review. Um, we have lots and lots of process controls. So for example, whether it's completed, whether we get the same output as last time. So this is all good. And here's our coverage. So if you want to see how is the process covered, what is a transfer? Transfer certificate. Yep. This one is actually 100% covered. But let's say we go to the upload case. So that's just one simulation. And of course, one simulation can never cover the entire article. So we can, but we can see that simulation went through this specific path. So we have insights of what paths we are actually taken by our simulation. And then basically the, the, the top one combines all the simulations and, and it's 100% for this particular case. <coughs> so let me just find actually the one that where we have also PQA failure. So here, for example, the long-term stability output change. So we keep track of any state change in the system and we create a diff and then we create compare the diffs and we use a, a JSON diff uh, tool to do this. And so we see here, uh, for some reason, this process now has a new email that is being sent and somebody didn't accept that properly. So that's uh, our QA tool and how we keep make sure that all our processes function all the time. And, and this is run, we can run this on a daily basis or, or even more often it takes about uh, what these days, 45 minutes to complete uh, for a full test run. Okay, so what's up in the future? Uh, I would love to write the Shoebox Chronicles. That's also something that I tried to do early in the days with the, uh, in the Zoop community. My dream was always to write these REST documents and describe, hey, run something like this in the browser, take a snapshot of the browser and insert a screenshot. And so, so that we can create support help autom in an automated way. And then a funny story to this, <clears throat> about two years ago, our customer success person was really enthusiastic about writing lots of support articles. So she kept writing and I said there like, in a few months, you will have to revise all of these. You will have to revise all of these. And no, 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 we keep writing, we keep writing. We had 72 of them. One month back, we finally did a review. We threw them all away. All 72 were completely thrown away because, of course, they completely bit rotted. Nothing in those support articles worked, uh, described anything like the system worked. So I would love to just create these support articles uh, via this. And it's not super hard. I would also like to automate video generation, right? Then you could have little self-support videos. And thanks to Selenium, uh, that shouldn't be a big deal. I just have not gotten around to, to hooking this up. The holy grail for us is to really support the power user. If you can use Excel or if you're a plone user, not a developer, but a user who can configure a system and create articles, you should be able to create processes in our system. So our idea is that eventually uh, people with legal expertise, lawyers, paralegals, can create new processes most easily. That is probably still about five years away because we would have to rewrite or, or do massive customizations to the editing tool and, and put a lot of more security in a lot of the Python expression evaluation, et cetera, right? So in the plural world, you're well aware of what it takes to allow people to enter arbitrary executable code. 
at whatever level. <coughs> and on a personal note, I would love to bike across the US before I get too old. So, okay. You never get too old, you just have to go very slow. Yeah, but I also have family, so my goal is to make it in 30 days. <laughs> um, questions, comments, and before I forget, please go to ploneconf6feetup.com and, and rate the talk. Yeah. So, um, as far as actually creating the workflow, that was one thing I didn't quite get. So, yep. it, I saw this uh, GUI tool, yep. and it looked like you're able to edit the visual representation of right. it. Um, and I saw the end result. Yep. Uh, so the web interface. Yep. So, we upload that XPDL file into our system. It's part of our source code. And I did a bunch of other things in the back end, such as creating tags, creating a new folder for this data room, creating an entry for the actions. All these are configuration, very much like you used to uh, from, the pl uh, from the plone world. And then it, it just works. We did, so there's no, I, did, I literally wrote zero Python code. Like zero, I had not to modify, I did not have to modify our code base, our Python code base, in order to make this work. So that, and that's is, is a very significant goal for us, that high level developers can do this. And I can, I'm more, more than glad, maybe after the talk, uh, for people who are interested to show them the editor tool and, and show you a little bit more of the magic that goes on behind and why the simulation work, why the wizard shows up, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? You spoke about um, having multiple objects that travel together. Yeah. And I wondered if you had, um, well, what we have is kind of a, where multiple objects travel together, but they travel through separate workflows that sometimes share states and then sometimes some of them will break off and come back. And so what we've got is these cascading workflow guards and rules that are just are way out of control. Right. And I wondered, what are you doing? Right. So that's, and that is an outcome of the state-based workflow approach, right? So what we are doing is basically we collect data. So uh, I did not bring up any of our sophisticated processes like incorporating a company which generates five documents, for example, post incorporation. When you set up your board and stuff, creates about 10 documents. So what we are doing is we are collecting the data via forms. You could do this in Plone very easily uh, with, with all the machinery that you have. Uh, and then we generate these documents in system steps and we can create many system steps to create many documents in all sorts of ways. And then we bring them back in. Uh, and, and then we, we move them along. Because your action is not really, so what's your action, right? And, uh, or what's, what's your goal? A process always achieves a high level goal. For example, incorporating a company, right? The, these documents, if they interact, they are not living in isolation. They, they move together, like for example, if you, I could imagine in the content management world, you have a lot of these things as I started. You might create an article that has images to it. You might want to, you need to push, you want to publicize this, so you push to some external website, right? So you have all these versions and, 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 and artifacts around, but your goal is still to publish an article. But it, in, in a case where... Give me a concrete example of what you're doing. I'll take, I'll take from that. In a case where you want to say, okay, you have 10 documents, but um, the people on the other side are in a real hurry, and they can't see anything until we've published the parent but we have two that we can't publish yet, but we want to pre-publish. We want to say, this thing is now being published, but the, the, the state of the main object is not published, but those eight have been published, and when the guy comes in, he can see, but these two are still out. So either he can't see them, or he can see that they're there, but they're in a different state. So the state of the inside of the state of things inside of those 10 is, is all over the place, but somehow the workflow needs to be able to say, when, when those two become ready to be published, he needs to be able to say, okay, well now, Right. So, so we would create one process instance, right, for each document that gets published. So you create ten publish a new article processes because you need to move ten need to be authored and whatnot. And then you, you, we would create, for example, you might have uh, something else uh, that is uh, called pre-published, right? You can say then, oh. Let me pre-publish on that. That would just be another process you execute. So we are not thinking of this as necessarily as one workflow, but it's, it's many workflows. So you could, you could publish the, the main container, and it, it, you could ask it then to push each of those 10 through its publish, and two of them will fail. But, but you see, you, you're still thinking very much in terms of state-based workflow, because you're thinking about publishing a container, 
or talking about making the container available, right? I would not even, like the, uh, the way I showed is like you wouldn't even think about a container. That's, that's just a site artifact that, that they live in the same container. Uh, like for example, the same folder or what, whatever. Um, what your real goal is to generate these articles, these, these documents, and that they live eventually at the same, like I would not make my permissioning based on the container, right? You want to really make your permissioning work against each document itself, and then you publish the document one by another, and thus you can apply different rules. Um, the, the, the code that you said is currently living somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Please, will you let us, I, want to, I really want to have a look at that. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, actually, one feedback when I did my practice run this morning with the company uh, was that he said like I should have added the, the links. I'll add the links to the slides, and then I put it on slide shares, and then it should be available. I'll send whatever Sally does with the publication, and you can look at it and, and, and get to it. Thank you. Yep. I have so many more questions, but I'll. I'll we, we, we can talk afterwards. I'm, I'm, I'm here. So, any, any other questions? Yeah, uh, Carlos. Another question, a comment. Uh, yeah. Uh, I saw your historical overview. Of, there was an activity based workflow for SOAP uh, that was created in Italy. It's called OpenFlow. I mean, right. Oh, yeah. You, why didn't you tell me this yesterday? I, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was open flow. But I, I think it, it now really, yeah, it was a, for a while, it was, I guess it was used. You know, it's just the same, the same terminology, the work items and the applications yes. and activities. And yeah, but, but they didn't use XPDR, I think. They, no, no, they didn't. They, they, they ran graphical, and right? It's, it obviously oh, yeah, that's right. Did, David DiVincenzo did that one, right? Open flow. David, David DiVincenzo developed open flow, I think. I think the names of the developers are uh, Richard Le Lemmy or something like that. Oh, Ricardo Lemmy. Oh, Ricardo. Ricardo Lemmy. Yeah, 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 right. Vincenzo yeah. Di Barone. Uh, Wait, Vincenzo Di Barone did that? He's in the... In the oh, that's, the that's why I, mean, I, I mixed this up. Yeah, no, yeah, no, that's no, no, Di Barone. No, sorry, sorry. No, Di Soma. Uh, Di Soma, Di Soma. Di Soma. Di Soma. Di Soma. That's right. Yeah, yeah no, they, that, that is true. I, 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 I forgot about that. There was open flow at some point. But of course, there's definitely no commits to that. Yeah. Uh, that, that would have been a good one to add, that's true. Huh? I tried to use it once in a project and didn't quite figure out. I, 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 I did use it for a bank. Uh, and, and any, any other questions? All right. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.